If this week, Parshas Vayera contains a uh, story that we're all familiar with, the story of the Akeda. And uh, every year, Rosh Hashanah, we invoke the merit of the Akeda. Rashi tells us an interesting thing, that the knife that was used is given a very unusual name. It's called the Ma'acheles, which literally means the feeder. Laha'achil means to, to feed. So uh, the question is, why is the knife given that unusual name? So Rashi says, because for eternity, we eat the merit of the Akeda. The knife, in a sense, provides this sustenance for us. So let's explore a little bit a, a very fundamental question. In the Akeda, obviously, there is the merit of Abram, and there is the merit of Yitzchak. Uh, Abram was an elderly man at this time. According to biblical chronology, he was 137 years old. Yitzchak was 37 years old. So Yitzchak certainly could have resisted um, Abram's efforts to slaughter him. So therefore, we have to assume that Yitzchak was a willing participant in the Akedah. So therefore, there was an act of sacrifice on the part of Yitzchak and an act of sacrifice on the part of Abram. Whose merit exactly are we invoking in Rosh Hashanah? The merit of Avram or the merit of Yitzchak? Now this happens to be a very technical dispute in halachic authorities regarding the correct wording of one of the prayers in Rosh Hashanah. In Rosh Hashanah, in the Musaf, Shemona Esrei, when we invoke the merit of the Akedah, the words we say are as follows. Va'akedas Yitzchak, the binding of Yitzchak, Lizaro Rachamim Tiskar. God should recall the binding of Yitzchak for his children. For his children. So what is the antecedent of the pronoun his? And we ask God, remember the Akeda of Yitzchak for his children. Who is his a reference to? Well, the simplest explanation is whenever you have a pronoun, you don't know what the antecedent is, you look for the immediately preceding noun. So it would seem that we're invoking the schus of Yitzchak. The akedas Yitzchak, the binding of Yitzchak, the zaro for his children, God should remember. So we're invoking the merit of Yitzchak, not the merit of Abraham, the merit of Yitzchak. And the Rivash raises a very serious question. You know, the Yitzchak had uh, two children. Yitzchak had Yaakov, and he had Esau. So uh, there's a problem here that the wording isn't clear. It tells us that God should remember the Akedah for the children of Yitzchak. The children of Yitzchak are not only the Jewish people, also the descendants of Esau. So the Rivash uh, says, that there are some that wish to say that the prayer should be amended. And they should say, Vakedas Yitzchak, Lizaro Shel Yaakov, Barachal and Tiskar. They should remember the Akeda of Yitzchak for the children of Yaakov. This makes it clear that we're not asking God to recall the Akeda for the benefit of the children of Esau, specifically for the children of Yaakov. So the uh, Rivash says, however, it's incorrect. It's a mistake to, to uh, make this correction. Because we know, the uh, Gemara tells us an interesting thing. The Gemara says, if a person makes a vow, and he says, I am not going to derive any pleasure from the seed of Avram, from Zerah Avram. So who is banned? From whom am I not allowed to derive pleasure? What about the descendants of Yishmael? What about the descendants of Esau? They're also from Avram. 
So the Gemara in the Durham says no. That the expression Zerah Avram only refers to Jews. Because God said to Avram, Ki be Yitzchak ikara lucha zara. Yitzchak is considered your seed. Yishmael is written off. So therefore, if a person makes a vow, I'm not going to derive any pleasure from the children of Avram, you can have all the pleasure you want from a descendant of Yishmael, because the descendants of Yishmael are not called the seed of Avram. And the more continues, well, what about the children of Esau? Okay. Yishmael is written off, but Yitzchak in turn had two children. So the Gemara says, no. Ki be Yitzchak velo kol Yitzchak. Ki be Yitzchak kar l'chazara. Part of Yitzchak's progeny will be considered the seed of Avram, but not all of them. So the Pasuk explicitly says that not all of Yitzchak's children are called Zerah Avram, the seed of Avram. It's only Yaakov and not Esau. So the Rebash says, we see from here that the expression of Zerah Avram excludes Yishmael and it excludes Esau. So there's no need to amend the prayer. This is what the Rebash says. The Morgan Avram, the commentator to the Shulchan Aruch, says that the argument of the Rebash is not persuasive. Because it's true that when we speak of the seed of Avraham, so Yishmael and Esav are excluded. When we speak of the seed of Yitzchak, maybe Esav is included. In other words, Esav is not considered a descendant of Avraham. Because ki be Yitzchak yikar lo chazara v'lo kol Yitzchak. Only part of Yitzchak's descendants are considered the seed of Avram. But maybe all of them are considered the seed of Yitzchak. And therefore the Mughan Avram says that the argument of the Rivash is not persuasive, and maybe the text should be amended to say, Zaro shall Yaakov. How is Puff? So, Bi means part of. Bi Yitzchak, in. In means a part of, but not the totality of. So the Matz the <coughs> commentary on the Morgan of Rome in the Shulchan Arach says that no, that um, it could be that the, the problem is not a problem at all. Because when we say Zar O, his children, it seems that the Rivash and the Morgan of Rome are assuming it means Zar O shall Yitzchak. So they raise this very, very technical point. Does the expression Zar O shall Yitzchak include Ace of Zar O shall Avram? Doesn't. Maybe Zar O shall Yitzchak does. But says the Matzah Shekel, but Zaro doesn't mean Zaro Shal Yitzchak. Zaro means Zaro Shal Avram. Because the antecedent of the pronoun his seed doesn't refer back to Yitzchak, who's mentioned immediately before. It refers back to Avram, who was mentioned earlier in the Bracha. And when we speak of Zara Avram, Zara Avram certainly excludes Ishmael and Esav. And therefore, the prayer as we have it is, is fine. Okay, I'm not going to quiz you. There's no uh, exam after the, the class. But the point is, we have here a dispute. Simply, when we say Zaro, that God should remember the Akedah for his children, the Rivash and the Mogan of Rome understand his children is a reference to the children of Avram. And the Machs Shekel understands that it's a reference to the children of, excuse me, vice versa. The, Malcolm of Rome and the Rebush understand it's a reference to the children of Yitzchak, and the Machs Shekel understands it's a reference to the children of, of Rome. This is a very, very strange dispute. What's the question? Are we invoking the merit of Yitzchak? Are we invoking the merit of, of Rome? Well, it could be that the question is, whose test was greater? Because obviously it's in our best interest to invoke the greater merit. Because why should we uh, make our weakest argument with God? We should make our strongest argument. So if we're going to invoke somebody's merit, it should be the greater merit. So perhaps this is the issue. That the Morgan of Rome and the Rivash understand that the greater merit is the merit of Yitzchak. It was the greater test. Therefore, his passing the test was the greater schutz. And the Machz Shekel understands that the greater merit is the merit of Avram. Therefore, it's the merit of Rome we invoke. 
but I think we can bring a very, very strong proof that the main test, the more difficult test, was Avram's test. Very, very elegant, simple proof. The Pasuk says, God tested Avram. Seems that was the real test. Now, let's explore that for a moment. Why would that be? Why would the merit of Avram, or the test of Avram, have been more difficult than that of Yitzchak? And therefore, why would his merit be greater? At least three reasons present themselves. Number one, the love of a father for his child is uh, greater than the opposite. Uh, the Gemara says a very interesting thing. The Gemara says there is a rule that uh, if someone is coming to burgle your house, you can assume that he's coming to kill you. And the rule is, the person is coming to kill you, ask him, kill him before he has the opportunity. This is the rule above Machteres. The person who is breaking into a house, you can assume that, that he's ready to kill. And the Gemara says there are exceptions. There's an exception. What's the exception? That if a father is coming to burgle his son's house, you can assume the father is not going to kill his son. So the son has no right to kill his father because the father is not going to kill the son. But vice versa, the Gemara says, that if the son is burgling the father's house, the father should assume that the son is out to kill him, and the father should kill him first. In other words, an amazing thing, the presumption is that if the burglar is the father breaking into the son's house, the father certainly is not going to, has no intention of killing the son. So the father is not considered a road name, he's not considered a pursuer, but in the opposite case, where the son is breaking into the father's house, that means the son is ready to, to kill. Now again, this is only anecdotal. But it seems to me, my years of reading the crime blotter, it seems to me that we hear more of children killing their parents than vice versa. I don't know, maybe uh, someone keeps statistics on this, but it just seems to me that way. But this is what the, uh, the Gemara says. So therefore, for Avram to kill Yitzhak was a much greater and he's so young, much greater test, and therefore his passing the test is a greater merit. Another point over here is that we know that each of the of us exemplified a different Mida. Now, in Kabbalah, Avram exemplifies the Mida of Chesed, we talked about this last week, and Yitzchak exemplifies the Mida of Gevura. So therefore, for Avram to perform the Akedah was something that was totally contrary to his nature. For Yitzchak to allow himself to be sacrificed was something that was consistent with his nature. Therefore, for Avram was a bigger task. Therefore, his schus is a greater schus. The third explanation, which to me seems the most poignant, is that, you know, in life, something which is final, and therefore defining of my life allows for greater motivation than something which in the entire context of my life may make very little difference. In other words, if a person would come to me and say, I write or it's hold the gun to my head, either commit avaydazara, commit idolatry, <laughs> or something like that, or else um, I'm going to blow your brains out. So at that moment, uh, as I uh, contemplate the alternatives, I tell myself that, you know, if I sacrifice myself, I'll keep it Hashem, this will be the defining act of my life. And uh, I will go to the next world, and I'll be welcomed into 
paradise of the Gan Eden, and uh, you know, that's a very strong uh, motivator to do the right thing. But let's say, for example, my alarm clock rings in the morning, and I'm facing a much lesser test. Should I get up and go to shul, or should I sleep in? So, you know, I tell myself, okay, really, it's the right thing to get up, go to shul, but on the other hand, within the context of my entire life, will it make that much of a difference if I miss one day? You know, it's not a defining event. Now, here, by analogy, it's the same thing. You see, Avraham is going to wake up the next morning after the Akedah. And the morning after that, and the morning after that. And he's going to live uh, many, many years. At least so he would assume. And the question would be that in the context of his life, would the Akedah make a difference? Or could God say, well, what have you done for me lately? Right. On the other hand, for Yitzchak, this was this would be the final act of his life. So to allow himself to be sacrificed would be, I think, easier than for Avram to perform the sacrifice, which may, all things considered, be, of course, a, a very, very important part of his life, but certainly not something that is defining in the same way that it would be defining for Yitzchak being at the conclusion of his life. But whatever the argument uh, goes, but this it says, that it was a test for Avram. So what could be the root of the machlokas? What could be the root of the dispute, whether we're invoking the merit of Yitzchak or the merit of Avram? If, if Avram's test was greater, and therefore his merit is greater, we certainly should want to invoke the merit of Avram. So what is the argument that we're really invoking the merit of Yitzchak? So we have to understand what is the whole idea of schus of us? What is the whole idea of, of the merit of the forefathers? I mean, what is this idea? We stand before God and we recognize that we ourselves may be guilty, but God should bless us and help us and give us a good year in the merit of our forefathers. Is it like using their bank card <laughs> to make withdrawals? I mean, what is the idea of schus of us? Riv Dessler quotes a very famous passage from Rebchaim of Elohim. We've said it many times. Rebchaim of Elohim makes a very, very interesting observation that in the fifth parak of Pirkei Abbas, Avram is mentioned twice. The first time he's mentioned, he's mentioned as Avraham. Asara Doros Minayach at Avram. There were ten generations from Nayach until Avram. Just Avram. That's how he's referred to, Avram. The next Mishnah says, Basara Nisyonais Nisnasa Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu, Avram our father, was tested with ten tests. So when we make je reference to the generations, he's referred to as Avram. When we make reference to the tests, he's called Avram Avinu. So how do you account for that difference? So Rukhayim Balonim explains that what is the idea of a test? What is the point of a, of a test? Hashem gives a test. Hashem knows whether we'll pass the test or not. Now you go for your driving test, you know, the uh, Ministry of Transportation has no idea whether you know how to drive or not. So they give you a test to make sure that you're confident and you'll be a safe driver before they issue a license. I understand. That's very important to give you a test. But Rebona Shalom knows. If the Rebona Shalom was running the Ministry of Transportation, he would have to give you a driver's test. He would just look at you and know, yeah, you'll, you'll drive well. Here's a license. No, you can't do it. No license for you. And he would do a better job than the Ministry of Transportation is doing. So what is the what is the point of, of, of giving tests? What, what does he, he need? The Torah uses that word, Nisaz Abraham. So there are various interpretations. The Ramban says, for example, the idea of a test is not because God doesn't know what you do. God knows how you'll perform. But God wants to reward you for actual performance. Because the reward for actual performance is greater than the reward for just being well-intentioned. You know, it reminds me of the story that there was once uh, a great rabbi, he was a great scholar, and uh, he was uh, given a book that was written by another great rabbi, and uh, he thumbed through the book, and he said, I could have written this book.
which may be true. But that person did write it. <laughs> you can't take that away from him. In other words, in, in terms of uh, reward from the Rebonish Lailam, the person who actually writes the book and thereby provides benefit for the entire Jewish community certainly is more deserving of reward than the person who could have written the book but didn't. So Akadosh Baruch Hu wants to reward Avraham for his performance, not for his good intentions. Therefore, Akadosh Baruch Hu subjects him to tests <coughs> so that he can be rewarded for passing the tests, as opposed to just being rewarded for being a person of good character. And uh, it's not a bad explanation, because uh, it makes a lot of sense that uh, to actually be rewarded, it should be for something you've actually done, not really for something that you would do had you been given the test. But Chaim Veloshner takes it a step further. He says like this. There's a pasuk in Mishlei, which says, Mishalech betumal tzadik, ashrei bonov achro. If a person goes in the ways of righteousness, his children are fortunate. His children are fortunate. And he writes that achieving certain spiritual levels, which required effort on the part of the parents, sometimes comes easier for the children. The children are born into it. You know, they they tell a story that uh, there was once the uh, son of a very, very great rabbi who was not particularly diligent in his own studies. So someone pointed it out to him, says, you know, if you want to be like your father, you're going to have to work harder, a little more uh, hasmoda, a little more application to your learning, because uh, that's how your father became such a big scholar. And if you're going to slack him off, it's not going to happen. So he says, let me, let me give you a, a muscle that illustrates the point. He said the following story that you know, um, in the Himalayas, there's some very high mountains and uh, people uh, climb these mountains. There once was a person who wanted to climb one of the high mountains in the Himalayas. So he uh, arranged for an expedition and he got all the supplies, the ropes and the tackle and the ladders and those Sherpa guides who, <laughs> you know, are all named Sherpa and they <laughs> take you up there. You know, it's, it's a joke. You talk about the people that, uh, that climb these mountains so, uh, you know, this is the first person to climb the mountain, and this is the... But it's not really true, because how do you have photographs that are taken downward of the people? Because these Sherpa fellows, they're up there first <laughs> with the camera, and they take the picture as you're coming up. Anyway, so uh, the guy arranged for the whole expedition, and uh, they climbed this high mountain, and, uh, yeah, it's very difficult and challenging, and Finally, after you know days of effort, they reach the top of the mountain, and on top of the mountain they find children playing there. They can't understand what's going on. It says that we have to climb this mountain with the ropes and the tackle and the sherpa, and these little kids are up there. She goes over to them and says, "What are you doing here? How did you get up here?" And they said, "We were born here." <laughs> so this uh, the son of the rabbi said that uh, it's true my father, to achieve his level of scholarship, had to work very hard. But I was born here. <laughs> I don't have to work so hard. Now the truth is it doesn't always work that way, but, but there is a little truth to it. That sometimes what the parents have to struggle to achieve comes a little bit easier for the child because he's born there already. Now this is really in, in two different ways. One element is nurture, and the other element is nature. There's nurture in the sense you're born into a different environment. You know, the parents, uh, maybe they have to struggle and they have to uh, fight with their own parents and there was opposition and uh, it was difficult. 
the children are born into a family structure which is more conducive and the parents imparted valuable lessons at a very young age and that's one aspect of it, the aspect of nurture, the way that children were raised. It's easier because the parents already fought the battles and now are transmitting it. And of course this is part of our experience, you know, we know many, many um, of us have had spiritual struggles in our lives and uh, our children don't have to grapple with them. By the way, it doesn't always work that way. Uh, just uh, as, a, as a warning, sometimes um, the fact that our children don't have to struggle and it's handed to them on a silver platter uh, makes them less motivated. You know, they're not uh, overcoming obstacles that are rising to challenges. Uh, it's a separate uh, issue. But th th there may be some truth to this idea, nevertheless. But there's also another aspect, which is the aspect of nature. Now, there is a spiritual genetics which operates here, which is a little bit different than physical genetics. When physical genetics is a law, the basic law of genetics is that acquired traits can't be inherited. Because if a person gets a tattoo and then gives birth to a child, the child will not be born with a tattoo. Now this fact was understood before anyone knew what a gene was. Now, the truth is all the principles of genetics were worked out before it was discovered that what genes are and DNA and so on and so forth. The, the biochemical grounding for genetics came much, 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 much later. But the rules of genetics were well established in the mid-1800s. But that's the basic rule of genetics. And now we know why that is, because we know that the genetic material, the DNA in the nucleus of the cell, carries all the information about the person, or the entire genome, and uh, anything you do to the organism subsequent to its birth cannot affect the configuration of the DNA in the nucleus, and therefore as a result, uh, acquired traits can't be inherited. But that's all on the physical level. On the spiritual level, we believe that spiritual traits can be passed down, that if a person acquires certain spiritual characteristics, they become part of the fabric of his neshama and in turn are imparted to the descendants. So this idea of ashrei bon of achrov, that the children of the tzaddik are fortunate, is first of all because of nurture, but also because of nature. Now, Chaim Veloshan says a very interesting thing, though. He says that only actualized potentialities can be passed down through this spiritual genetics. Latent potentialities, which have not been actualized, are not passed down. Or something which is a potential is a potential, but it's not really in the spiritual DNA, if you will. And therefore, he says, the reason Avraham Avinu had to be subjected to the Asara and the Sionis, the Ten Tests, was so that these potentialities could be realized, could be actualized, and therefore in turn imparted to his descendants. Had Abraham Avinu not been subjected to these tests, even though he would have passed, he had the potential to pass them, but these latent potentialities would not have been passed down. It's only the actualized qualities which are transmitted. But are they can they be transmitted to a child after he's born? Wait, 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 wait. Hold your horses. We're going to talk about that, okay? So this is what Reb Chaim Abolajan says. The Reb Chaim Abolajan understands that's why the Mishnah emphasizes Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu. Specifically with regards to the Asar and the the reason he was given these ten tests is that he should function as our father in 
transmitting these traits to us. And therefore, Kabbalah points out that there's so many things that Jews find themselves doing, even simple Jews. And you wonder, where do they have the power, the spiritual strength to do these things? You know, you find that uh, one day a Jew wakes up and he has this idea, this dream of going to Israel. And he picks himself up and moves to Israel. And nowadays, as difficult as it is, it's much, much easier than it was once upon a time. Because nowadays you have, uh, what's that organization? Uh, uh, Nefesh Nefesh. Nefesh, Nefesh, you know, they eliminate some of the <laughs> red tape. But, you know, talk about moving to Eretz Israel 300 years ago, 400 years ago, 500 years ago, you're talking about deprivation, poverty, disease. <laughs> life threat. Danger. Uh, and people did it. Someone got this idea and they said, and he did it. Where did it come from? Says Reb Chaim of Elijah, it came because Abraham Avinu was able to perform the test of Lech Lecha, and therefore that ability to extend oneself for Eretz Yisrael became part of the fabric of the Jewish people. Now, it's interesting. They would ask an interesting question. But what about those tests that follow the birth of Yitzchak, such as the Akedah? How does that work? Isn't that nurturing? So, I would suggest that that is the difference. That the tests that preceded the birth of Yitzchak, those potentialities are transmitted through nature, through spiritual genetics. But those tests that follow the birth of Yitzchak are only transmitted through nurture, through example, through inspiration, through instruction, but not through this pathway of genetics. Just to illustrate this, I'll just mention Rav Chut Nazir Hasadah Ben Racha quotes a very cute story. There were two sons of a certain great tzaddik who were arguing with each other one day. Right? Apparently the younger one started up with the older one. So the older one says, you're starting up with me? So I'm older than you. So the younger one said, I'll say it in Yiddish, then translate it, says, du bist elder mit deine yar. Says, you're older with your own years. Says, ich bin elder mit de tatens yar. <laughs> says, I'm older with the father's years. <coughs> you get it? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. He's saying a very, very good thing. It's true. You're older than me. Right? But who received a greater spiritual legacy from the father? The younger one says, I was, because I was born to the father when he was older than when you were born. Let's say, for example, the father was 30 when he gave birth to the older son, and he was 40 when he gave birth to the younger son. So it's true that the older son is 10 years older than the younger son with his own years. But with the, from the father's years, the younger son has ten more years than... <laughs> which illustrates this point, right? Like a very clever... Pretty sharp. Yeah. Now you have to appreciate a snappy answer has some, <laughs> something to be said for it. But is it, is it, is it... Seems to me, if I could answer my own question, uh, Akash Baruch Hu knows that Abraham is going to have the test and pass the test. So he knows that Abraham is going to make this test not potential, but in reality. Yeah, but but, but it's, at this point, it's still potential. Until he does it, it's only potential. It can't be transmitted. But not in God's mind. What? But not in God's mind. Yeah, even in his mind. At this point, in the temporal framework in which human beings live, it didn't happen yet. Forget the question of God's perspective, but it, we live in this world, which is uh, bound by time. So there's a present and there's a future, right? So at this point, what is going to happen in the future doesn't change the reality of the present. Well, what I'm saying is, if God knows that that is that that potential is going to become real, if but, God is aware of it, but, but we exist. He pass that on? But we exist in a temporal framework. So at this point, the father doesn't yet have it when he gives birth to the child. But it's good enough to be actualized. Okay, it's good enough for God. But this, I, I think, is the idea. So let's 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 contemplate this distinction. There's something which the father achieves before he gives birth to the child can be transmitted in this genetic way. Something which the father achieves after the child can be born can only be transmitted through instruction, through inspiration, and so on and so forth. Okay. What is the idea of schus of us? What is the idea of the merit 
of the of the forefathers. As we ask the question, what does it mean? It's just that, that you you uh, somehow can access their account. So it's their traits, I guess. We're talking about. They're a member of a private club, so you get an automatic. <laughs> Someone was telling me a story, an amazing story about what a son was able to hack into his father's accounts and empty them out. It was just <laughs> an amazing story. Is that really it? So Rudessa says, no, that's not the point. The point is like this. He gives a marshal. Let's say you have two juvenile offenders come before the bench for the court, for the judge. They both committed the same act of vandalism together. One, on the other hand, comes from a very strong family, good people, good stock. Loving family, good people, ethical people. The other one comes from a family where this behavior is par for the course. Who will the judge give a second chance to more readily? So I guess with Dessler, there's a strong argument to be made that the, this kid who comes from that type of family, a criminal family, a, a, a degenerate family, says, what's the use of giving him a second chance? The second time around won't be any better than the first. So this other family comes from such good stock. There is a hope of rehabilitation. There is a pro hope of improvement. There is a hope of maybe rising to the challenge in the future. Says so that's, that's what Schuss of us is. Schuss of us is that a Kodesh looks at us and says, "Look, it's true, you messed up, but considering where you came from, you came from Avraham, from Yitzchak, and Yaakov. You have this legacy. It's worthwhile giving you a second chance. That's what it's all about. That's the idea of Schuss of us. That's the the merit of the of us." When we talk about the Akedah, we are descendants of Yitzchak after the Akedah. We are descendants of Avram from before the Akedah. Because Yitzchak was born before the Akedah, obviously. Right? Don't have to prove that, right? That's, <laughs> that's really self evident. So, therefore, what Avram achieved in the Akedah cannot be transmitted to us genetically. It only can be transmitted through example, through illustration, through inspiration, but not genetically. But what Yitzchak achieved in the Akedah can be transmitted to us genetically because Yitzchak's children were born to him after the Akedah. So it could be everyone agrees that Avram's merit in the episode of the Akedah is greater than Yitzchak's merit. Because after all said and done, the Pasuk says that Lekim Nisus Avram was a greater test for Avram than it was for Yitzchak. So if I compare Avram to Yitzchak, Avram's merit is greater than Yitzchak's merit. But if we're talking about us invoking the Schuss of the Avos, making the claim that somehow we inherited the legacy of the Avos, is a very strong argument that we have to invoke the schus of Yitzchak and not the schus of Avram. Because what Avram achieved at the Akedah cannot be transmitted to us because Yitzchak already was born. It's only what Yitzchak achieved at the Akedah that can be transmitted to us. And that's why we invoke the schus of Yitzchak. So it's true that the merit of Avram is greater than the merit of Yitzchak. But the merit that we count on is the merit of Yitzchak. Because it's that which we inherited after Yitzchak succeeded at the Akedah. So that's a, a thought. Um, I thought I read somewhere that Avram went into the Akedah's Yitzchak process knowing that he wasn't going to have to actually do the act. It doesn't seem from Chazal that way. Chazal certainly understand that he was willing and ready willing and ready to yes, do it and, and, and he genuinely thought he was gonna have to do it. They genuinely did that. Yeah. I just want to share with you one one last thing about the arcade not related to anything we said until now. Just uh, 
Uh, the Gemara says in several places that the Rebunish Loilam sees the ashes of Yitzchak on the altar. The Gemara in Taina says that there was a custom on a fast day, which is a day of prayer, they would take ashes and they would put them on the heads of the people, they put them on the Aron Kaidash even. And the Gemara says, why is that? In order that Akadosh Baruch Hu should remember the ashes of Yitzchak Avinu. So the Sfasemes asks the obvious question, what do you mean the ashes? It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. right? The Akedah never took place. Yitzchak never was, was slaughtered on the, on the altar. It says, uh, Abraham Avinu brought an aisle, he brought a ram in place of Yitzchak. So perhaps you have the ashes of the ram. But what does it mean, the ashes of Yitzchak? Now the simple answer, the simple answer is, that if you look in the Chumash, when Abraham brought the ram, it says that he brought the ram tachas bino. He brought the ram in place of his son. And Rashi says, al kol Every part of the ritual that he performed on the ram, he prayed, and he said, It should be as if I performed this on my son. As if my son was slaughtered. As if his blood was sprinkled. As if he was skinned. As if he was burnt and turned into ash. Now, just as an aside, this is a fantastic Rashi. Now, this Rashi is one of the bits of evidence contrary to Kierkegaard's reading of the story of the Akedah. You know, the famous uh, existentialist, Sir Kierkegaard, wrote a book about the Akedah, Fear and Trembling. And his reading of the Akedah, what is the real test of the Akedah? Of course, on the simplest level, the, the willingness to overcome the natural love for a child, to perform the Akedah. But he understands there was another issue here uh, as well because there is a natural moral sense that killing is wrong. Certainly this was well developed in Avram, and that Avram was willing to suspend his own judgment to perform the, the Akedah is a tremendous act of uh, faith, of trust in God, that he suspended his own judgment to be able to perform the, the Akedah. The truth is that uh, this is not correct, this approach. Because we find earlier in the Parsha, when uh, Avram is uh, informed that the city of stone is going to be destroyed, Avram doesn't accept God's judgment as a matter of faith. Avram prays that the people of stone be spared. And he says, Khalil Far be it from you. Hashayfet kol haaretz lo yasa. Mishpat God, who is the judge of the entire world, should not do justice. You know, if they destroy the city, even if there are righteous people there, can't be. So we see that Abraham has no hesitation. He, he's going to question God's judgment. Why by the Akedah or not? What could he, all of a sudden, by the Akedah, he suspends his, uh, his, his principles because of pure faith? What about the earlier story of the destruction of the stone? <laughs> uh, the answer is much more simple. More simple than that. The answer is that there, God said, I am going to destroy the city of stone as a punishment. Right? Their evil has come before me. I am judging the city. I'm going to punish the city. So, Abraham said, <laughs> justice? <laughs> this doesn't conform to any standard of justice. You don't kill the righteous with the wicked um, and call that just. Over here, when Avram asked, when Hashem asked Avram to bring Yitzchak as the Akedah, Hashem didn't tell Avram, I'm punishing Yitzchak for some sin that he committed. I'm asking you to make a sacrifice to God. That's a beautiful thing, it's a lofty thing. That isn't a violation of some principle of justice. To punish an innocent person is a violation, a travesty of justice. But to bring oneself as a sacrifice to God, what principle of justice is that? 
by the way. He was taught the whole time. He's been running around teaching everybody to, to not to do human sacrifice. I mean, there were pagans that were doing that. That, that may be the case, but that's not a principle of justice. In other words, that's just an assumption of what God's tastes are, that God doesn't like human sacrifice. And uh, maybe God, uh, I made a mistake about that. Maybe God doesn't like human sacrifice. But the point is this. But however you understand the story, it's clear from this Rashi that even after God said, no, I don't want you to do it, Avram held that it would be something commendable. <laughs> That's why he says, that, okay, you're not letting me do it, but at least let it be as if I did it, which certainly would not be a meaningful prayer if uh, bringing a child as a sacrifice was something that was intrinsically important. Is there a measure that he wanted to nick? That, that's just, that mentions that to you. You actually didn't want to do it. So the simple answer is that that is uh, the ash that the Gemara refers to. The ash. Hashem answered his prayer. Hashem accepted his prayer. So therefore, when he brought the ayo, it's as if he did it to Yitzhak, and therefore the ashes of the ayo are really the ashes of Yitzhak. That's the simple answer to the question. That's why the Gemara makes reference to the ashes of Yitzhak. But the Svasemes says an amazing answer. So Sema says, you know, in life, there is the, the realm of action, the Olam Hamasa, and there's also the realm of Machshava, the realm of thought. So he says like this, he says that it's true, in the Olam Hamasa, in the realm of action, Avram never performed the Akedah. But in the Olam Hamachshava, in the realm of thought, he went through the Akedah countless times. We all have this experience, and when we, we think about something uh, terrible that may happen, and uh, it almost seems inevitable, and uh, we, we are scared and frightened and, and, and praying it shouldn't happen, but nevertheless, you know, our ability to fantasize gets the best of us, and we, we live through that bitter experience even before it happens, right? We've all had this experience. Anybody who's lost a loved one, certainly has probably had this experience of living through the death many times before the actual death. Because in the Olam Hamasa, in the realm of action, the death only occurs once. But in the realm of Machshav, in the realm of thought, we live through, uh, we live through it again and again and again and again and again. Because whenever we, we think about what may happen, because we have that emotional experience of living through that, that experience. Now, that, that's a, a bitter way of putting it, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put it facetiously in a, in a lightheaded way. You know, uh, in the realm of machshava, in the realm of thought, I've won the lottery many times. <laughs> <laughs> I even spent the money many times. <laughs> in the realm of Hamas, it hadn't happened yet, right? But in the realm of machshava, I've gone through the experience. And it was very gratifying. It was very gratifying to pay off my debts and, and give a lot of money to Stalker and you know, buy myself a nice house and <laughs> all, all things you do a lot of money. So, you know, you go through the experience, it's almost as good as actually living through it. Now, the Gemara says, by the way, in certain areas, the fantasies are better than the reality. Mm -hmm. right? The Gemara says, they're Avera, Kashme Avera. Fantasies about committing a sin are better than the actual sin. Right, more pleasurable. Because the actual sin always has a, a negative side to it. Because the fantasies are pristine, are pure, are perfect. But this is the idea. We have the Olam HaMachshava and the Olam HaMasa. So the, the uh, Swasema says that it's true that Abram never performed the Akedah in the Olam HaMasa. In the Olam HaMachshava, he lived through the Akedah many, many, many times. So therefore, that's the ash that God sees. God sees the ashes of the Akedas that Abraham lived through. Now, Dessler talks about this idea, and he says an amazing, amazing thing, a very practical thing. He talks about, you know, we all face challenges in life. We all, we all face challenges. And uh, we all want to know how can we face those challenges more successfully? How can we cultivate the strength and the fortitude to be able to rise to the challenge. So there's an amazing thing, that if you live through the experience in thought, then when it actually happens, you're not living through it the first time. You're living through it the second time, the third time, you're more prepared. You're more prepared. 
Is this a Rodessa sentence? It is a right sentence. It's an amazing thing. You know, there's a, um, <coughs> there is a literature that has been, uh, you know, developing in the professional journals discussing the following question. Let's say if a, you know, a got say for such a thing. Let's say a mother is um, going to deliver a child which has some condition, maybe a genetic disease or so on and so forth, which will mean that the child will be severely handicapped or perhaps die at a very young age. Is it better to inform the mother as soon as the information is available, or is it one better wait until the child is born and then die with Tsar Like why uh, bring up the matter early? And the, uh, the consensus of the literature is that uh, almost universally held that it is better to inform the mother in advance that she be psychologically prepared for the for the worst. And uh, you know, just delaying and you know, taking the attitude of dial of sarvashaita, it's good enough to worry about it when the time comes, is not a very practical strategy. In other words, it's true that you might argue that, uh, you know, why encumber her with uh, you know, five additional months of, of pain and difficulty, but the truth is the opposite. Giving her the ex opportunity to live through the experience in the realm of machshava makes her better able to cope with it in the olam hamasa when that time comes. Now this, right, this is true about nisyanus generally. That in other words, when we when we are facing a difficult situation or a, even a desperate situation, to push it out of our minds and say I'm not going to worry about it until the time comes, is not the optimal strategy for being able to cope with it appropriately. So if you take that strategy that until the time comes, I'll push out of my mind. And when it happens, then I'll deal with it then. So uh, you'll be dealing with the first time. Undoubtedly, there'll be panic, there'll be, there'll be uh, you know, bad decisions made, and so on and so forth. Living through it, and you might say that, uh, you know, what's the point of living through this experience again and again and again and again? But each time, there's more understanding, there's more preparation. And ultimately, it comes to pass. You do have the experience. So you're, you're better prepared to make the right decisions and to cope with it emotionally. And therefore, that's the idea that Rodessa says, based on this, this concept, that uh, the experiences that go through life are not only in the Olam Ha Ma'asa, the realm of action, but they also take place in the realm of Bakshav, in the realm of thought as well. So uh, everyone should have a Easy trip home. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 In the Olam Hamas, and I don't know.